This episode of Yesterworld is sponsored by Audible. Visit audible.com slash yesterworld or text yesterworld to 500-500 to receive one free audiobook and two free Audible originals when you begin your free 30-day trial. Did I mention it's free? Plus, you'll be supporting the channel, so it's a win-win for both of us. In 2017, we explored five abandoned movie sets and filming locations, and ever since, a lot of you have requested a part two of sorts, but I've always been hesitant to do another, as many of the others out there have already been covered countless times or have no real story beyond they were once a movie set and now they're abandoned. That being said, I finally found enough stories behind five more abandoned movie sets and filming locations to justify doing another episode, so sit back, relax, and enjoy this long overdue follow-up. Okay, so it's probably not too surprising that Universal Studios Hollywood has abandoned movie sets, especially since many are featured on the studio tour itself. But there's one in particular that's truly abandoned in every sense of the word and still exists today. The operations building from the Lost World Jurassic Park and Jurassic Park 3. Alan. What makes this one especially interesting is that initially the operations center was to be part of a much larger movie set known as the Workers' Village. Not only that, but it was supposed to be the main location for the big finale to the Lost World Jurassic Park. Basically, the original ending was to be a spectacular chase sequence through the worker's village, where Ian Malcolm, Sarah, and Kelly race towards a helicopter to be rescued. They're pursued by velociraptors, and shenanigans ensue through the village's buildings and facilities. Once they reach the helicopter, a group of pteranodons appear, attacking the pilots and stabbing one of them through the chest with its beak. Thankfully, they still managed to escape in the helicopter, and the final scene in The Lost World was to be John Hammond's funeral. I think I'll have that on the tour. Originally, the operations center was to be located at the base of a cascading waterfall, which is precisely why the production team chose to build the set near the studio tour's original push-button waterfall. The effect as part of the tram tour was abandoned sometime in the 70s, becoming far more beneficial as a permanent movie set. However, eventually the original ending to The Lost World was abandoned, instead of having the T-Rex escape in San Diego. So the worker's village was drastically reduced in scale, and only parts of the original ending would serve as the climax to Act 2. The Pteranodon attack was scrapped altogether, despite animatronic prototypes having already been constructed. This resulted in several playsets and toys of the operations center making little to no sense, as they were already in production when the finale was altered. The partial Workers' Village and Operation Center was built in 1996, and appears in the movie as you see it today. After filming was complete, the set remained on the studio tour, along with several props and set pieces from the exciting sequel. When production began on Jurassic Park 3 four years later in the year 2000, the Operation Center was used once again for the incredibly mediocre sequel. Alan. The set continued as a highlight on the studio tour for several years until another Steven Spielberg production would take its place. However, the set for Jurassic Park 2 and 3 wasn't demolished, but simply left abandoned right behind the War of the World set. Alan. Year after year after year, the operation center fell into further disrepair, and eventually it seems the entire building collapsed on itself. The location still exists to this day, as a remnant of only the second worst Jurassic Park sequel. In the 1970s, Duke Energy began construction on a multi-billion dollar nuclear power plant in Gaffney, South Carolina. The initial plan was for three nuclear reactors, and while a bunch of the technical jargon goes well over my head, suffice to say, the Cherokee Nuclear Station was going to be the world's largest nuclear power plant. But then came the disaster of Three Mile Island in 1979, the worst nuclear disaster in U.S. history. The cooling system broke down this morning. Some radioactive steam escaped into the air. Radiation was detected a mile away from the plant. By 1981, the first reactor of the Cherokee plant was partially constructed, but due to the economic and legal ramifications tied to the Three Mile Island accident, two of the three reactors were put on indefinite hold. The following year, the project was abandoned altogether, despite half a billion dollars having already been put into the facility. Enter filmmaker James Cameron nearly a decade later, as during pre-production on his next movie called The Abyss, he made it clear to the studio that he wanted to do all the film's complex underwater scenes 
well, underwater. However, since the movie called for massive and intricate set pieces, this would require an equally massive water tank, which at the time simply didn't exist. Somehow, the film crew stumbled upon the unfinished nuclear power plant and realized this was just what they needed. One of the unfinished turbine pits was chosen for the smaller but still massive water tank B and would be used for the smaller scale underwater scenes for the movie. For the much, much larger water tank A, the production team chose the unfinished and abandoned main reactor containment structure, as despite only partially constructed, it was built to withstand some of the most extreme types of conditions imaginable. Or, you know, holding a freaking nuclear reactor. Here we go! Yeah. This is a historic moment! It took a full five days to fill the 7.5 million gallon water tank, and the monolithic structure would house the largest underwater set ever constructed. Now going into the production problems, near-death experiences, and just overall nightmare of shooting in these tanks is for another episode, but suffice to say, it was far from pleasant. Uh, my light just went dead. George, it's a rehearsal, shut up! After filming was complete, with the production already behind schedule and over budget, Fox Studios decided to simply abandon the water tanks and sets within. For nearly 30 years, these went virtually untouched, eventually becoming a popular urban exploration destination. And while time certainly took its toll on the structures and abandoned movie set, it was a true testament to the cinematic achievement of the Abyss. The location was finally demolished and dismantled in September of 2007. However, Tank B still exists today as a reminder of this once incredible filming location. Gone with the Wind is often praised as one of the greatest films ever made. It broke Academy Awards records, was released over eight times in theaters, and when adjusting for inflation, is the highest grossing film of all time. The movie also features one of the most iconic houses in film history, Terra. Now just to quickly address the elephant in the room, the house was depicted as a cotton plantation, and the film was and is heavily criticized for its glorification of slavery. However, that doesn't take away from the house's place in cinematic history as an iconic movie set. After all, it is mentioned over 50 times in the film. And when I'm gone, I leave Tara to you. Tell me about Tara. Tara. Home to Tara. Tara. I'm taking you to Tara. Tara. I can't do everything at Tara all by myself. What do I care about Tara? I hate Tara. After filming was complete, many of the sets from Gone with the Wind became tourist attractions as part of the tours given at RKO Pictures, and for nearly 20 years, Tara was one of the highlights. But perhaps not recognizing the film's cinematic importance, it was basically left to rot with no upkeep or refurbishments. By 1960, the abandoned movie house had become only a shadow of its former self and was dismantled, with many believing it was permanently destroyed. Unless you happen to pick up a copy of the Atlanta Constitution, as it turns out the house was sold to Julian M. Foster, who shipped it to Georgia with the intention of it becoming a tourist attraction. However, due to licensing issues with the estate of the author of Gone with the Wind, plans were eventually shelved. In 1979, the Terra House was sold to the wife of a former governor of Georgia, who also had plans to restore it as part of a Gone with the Wind theme park. Once again this fell through, only this time for financial reasons, and the iconic movie house was stored in an old dairy barn. I'm standing in the midst of the pieces of the most iconic piece of movie history ever. I'm standing amidst the pieces of Tara. For several decades, the Terra House set pieces remained in that old dairy barn, with numerous attempts to launch campaigns to restore the house. Unfortunately, while the front door eventually found its way into a museum and fully restored, the rest of the house continued to rot away in that old dairy barn. In 2019, both the door and set pieces were sold to an anonymous buyer, so knock on wood, the story of the Terra House will one day have a happy ending. Okay, okay, so these aren't technically movies, but when I stumbled upon them during my research, I couldn't resist. I'm a tot, for three's and tot, TV, tub, tiny, we're the tots and tot, TV, one, two, three, boo! The British television show Tots TV initially ran from 1993 to 1998 in the UK, and on PBS in America for two years in the late 90s. The show won a handful of awards and was very popular among children, spanning across nearly 300 episodes with many home video releases and forms of merchandise. So it should come as no surprise that many in the UK who grew up with the show wondered what happened to the iconic and memorable cottage home to the terrifying Tots. 
I mean, beloved characters, once the show ended. Hi guys, welcome back to another video. Today I've got one for the 90s kids, and with the Tots TV house. While it may have taken over 20 years, but one urban explorer by the name of Lost With Lou managed to track down the filming location in Warwickshire, England. To say the set had fallen into disrepair is an understatement, as nature had clearly taken its course many years prior. It was a pretty shocking and horrifying discovery for those with fond memories of the once pristine and cozy cottage, which now looked like something out of the Blair Witch Project. However, another abandoned set from a show you might have grown up on, especially if you were a Nickelodeon kid like me, was Hey Dude. Hey Danny! How are hey. you? Sandwich! No, we are not going through another summer of that again, understand? Hey Dude aired on Nickelodeon and was the station's early attempt at appealing to the teenage demographic, spanning across five seasons and 65 episodes. One of the signature locations, and only locations of the show, was the Bar Nun Dude Ranch. In reality, the sets were built just outside Tucson, Arizona, and many of the building's interiors and exteriors were built from scratch for the show. Once the series ended in 1991, the entire ranch and all of its set pieces were completely abandoned. You can actually see a lot of this fencing in the shots. The show was on from 1989 to 1991. Two years, but a lot of the memories of some of the scenes out here live on. The ranch still exists today and is both surprisingly intact in terms of the basic structures, while at the same time in horrible disrepair. The inside of the main lodge still contains familiar, though horribly decayed, set pieces from the show. The boys and girls cabin also exists, though anything recognizable from the show has long since been removed. Overall, it's a pretty incredible remnant of the past, though for exactly how long it'll go before being demolished is unclear. Thank you for embarking upon your journey with Air New Zealand. May your path always be guided by the light of the stars, and may the future bestow upon you all the happiness and adventure our Middle Earth has to offer. When you hear the words New Zealand, chances are you immediately think of the Lord of the Rings, as the country's beautiful locations played a major role in the films. Now of all the locations within the trilogy you can visit today, and there are a lot of them, Hobbiton may very well be the most iconic. It's here where you can immerse yourself into the most memorable region of the Shire, with plenty of activities, dining experiences, and just overall Hobbit-infused atmosphere. But it wasn't always that way. Okay, it wasn't that bad. You see, back when the original Lord of the Rings trilogy was being filmed in New Zealand, the filmmakers used a sheep farm for the location of Hobbiton. The production team worked tirelessly to make the home of the Hobbits feel truly lived in, with immaculate and detailed set pieces and beautiful landscapes. Once the scenes for Hobbiton wrapped in 2001, most of the elaborate set dressings were dismantled and destroyed. They uh, looked a lot better during filming, obviously, when they had them manicured. Secrecy is a big part in the uh, mystique of what was here for when they released the movie, and they took everything away in on completion of filming. However, the permanently altered landscape and basic structures of the Hobbit homes were abandoned by the studio and left to be reclaimed by nature. But then the Lord of the Rings trilogy released a record-breaking box office performance and critical acclaim, with fans desperately wanting to visit the on-set locations. So the landowners of Hobbiton, aka the Sheep Farm, created Ring Scenic Tours, charging $30 a person to visit the abandoned movie set, which saw 12,000 visitors in the first 11 months alone. However, instead of encountering hobbits, visitors encountered livestock, as the land became home to over 12,000 sheep and 250 cattle. Maybe I thought there's some, some more things from the film left. The Alexander family, who owned the farm, tried to get funding to rebuild Hobbiton to appear as how it did in the films, but unfortunately New Line Cinema forbid them from doing so much as replanting a single flower, because, you know, money. Now if you're like me, you weren't a huge fan of the Hobbit films, but we do have to thank them for one thing, reviving Hobbiton. This time around they built it for real. Doing The Hobbit now, it gave us the ability to rebuild Hobbiton out of permanent materials. Had it not been for the Hobbit movies, which should have been a two-part movie at most instead of a stretched-out trilogy with an awkward love triangle and shoehorn subplots, Hobbiton would still be abandoned today. It took a full two years to rebuild and regrow the entire fantasy countryside, but Hobbiton was finally returned to its former Shire glory. So for once an abandoned movie set has a happy ending, and jokes aside, it's a beautiful and stunning level of immersion we rarely get from our favorite films of the past.
Speaking of immersion into your favorite movies, if you're like me, while you may not love every single Star Wars movie, you love the Star Wars universe and have always been interested in reading the movie novelizations or extended universe series, but just never found the time. Read them, have you? Or not? Well, that's where Audible comes in, as they have every single Star Wars title I've ever been curious to read in one convenient location. Personally, I've always wanted a deeper dive into Anakin's transformation and early years as Darth Vader, so Dark Lord Rise of Darth Vader and the novelization of Revenge of the Sith were easily my first choices. Oh yes, Anakin, I know all of your secrets now. With Audible, each month you receive credits for one audiobook and two Audible originals, with any unused credits rolling over every month. And even if you have to cancel for financial reasons, every audiobook you download is yours to keep forever, free to listen to on the go, anywhere, anytime. Plus, every sign-up supports the channel, and the 30-day free trial is, you know, free. Just visit audible.com slash yesterworld or text yesterworld to 500, 500 to receive one free audiobook and two free Audible originals when you begin your free 30-day trial. As always, thank you all so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe, like, and do all that because I'm completely losing my voice. And we'll see you next time on Yesterworld.